Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. Much like how we identify eras of Earth's history by its dominant clades, Chimerian paleontologists recognize periods of time by diagnostic flora and fauna. In times of ecological turmoil, especially with widespread population loss, the portal of Chimere harvests new life from Earth. As new fauna brings competition and disease, this can result in more extinctions, which in turn prompt further harvests. When there is stability, the portal lies dormant, and this slumber can last for millions of years. Cycles of harvest or torpor are usually used by Chimerian paleontologists to identify eras of their planet's history. If a period of environmental stability and portal dormancy lasts long enough, these eras are called dynasties. The most famous of these is the Tyrant Dynasty, a period of around 55 million years without harvest wherein the megafauna of the known world was primarily comprised of dinosaurs from Maastrichtian Asia. The length of this dormancy that qualifies it as a dynasty is arbitrary. For example, some scholars consider the nearly 5 million years after the sloth harvest to be a dynasty, Others call this anchored period to be too short to qualify. As on Earth, the fossil record of Chimere is extremely fragmentary. Paleontologists are given only a few of a thousand puzzle pieces from which to make inferences about a given ecosystem. Thankfully, a robust backlog of analogous ecosystems and related fossil taxa help experts fill in a lot of the gaps, so it's not as if they're working in a void, but it does lead to a lot of inference with only a few points of confident reference. Chimerians working for the Great Library have been collecting fossils for millennia, albeit at a much slower pace than modern humans due to how many dangers are present in their field, but it has only been in the past few decades that paleontologists from the Great Library are able to get a more complete picture of harvests and what dynasties looked like since they can compare their records to our own thanks to working with the Assembly. The first time life was harvested from Earth is fairly reliably understood to be sometime around the middle to late Devonian. Chimere already had gravity and an atmosphere amiable to Earth life, which is why our planet succeeded while so many others before it failed, though it still seems to have taken several harvests and many millions of years for the groundwork to be established such that animals could persist in great abundance. The first harvest to have large fauna that actually managed to persist longer than a few generations and adapt to new endemic species was in the late Devonian, and included such icons as trilobites, eurytorids, and arthrodires like Dunkleosteus leviathan, a robust fish that became Chimera's first apex predator. In this age, the oceans teemed with life. Life on land spread at a slower pace. The food chains in the oceans had a head start as the indigenous microbial life of Chimere served as a food base to help the marine ecosystem become established. Without soil, only bedrock and a few patches of indigenous ground cover, land plants didn't have many places to take root. Some fungi could grow on and even into rock, which made up a majority of the larger flora. There was already dioxide in the air thanks to indigenous photosynthesis bolstered by this new flora, so some critters survived, though size was extremely restricted. Fungi continued to spread, and their roots being able to bore into rock and help break it down and release vital nutrients. As microbial decomposers able to break down cellulose and other tough parts of plants had not yet evolved, fire was Chimere's first decomposer. Fungal obelisks would have attracted a lot of lightning to start these fires. Ash from this mass burning further helped establish Chimere's first soil. The more this occurred, the more plants were able to take hold. More soil meant more plants, which meant more oxygen, which meant more fire, which helped spread more soil. On Earth, this took hundreds of millions of years. 
On Chimir, as increasingly derived plants and fungi were collected and introduced to Chimir, it was a much more rapid process. Soil and plants took over the planet in a staggering ecological boom. Though plants are often seen as the foundation of life on Chimir, it was only made possible by the foundation of fungi and fire. The breaking of rock done by fungi and reinforced by plants unleashed a tremendous amount of nutrients, notably phosphorus and nitrogen, into the water system. This was fantastic for a jungle now taking over the land. Unfortunately, it had dire consequences for the sea. As outlined in my trilobite episode, a soup of algal and magical blooms made the shallow marine habitats a toxic wasteland. While the land was in its prime, the waterways were a desert, undergoing Chimera's first mass extinction. As many as 95% of all marine life was driven to extinction, eliminating the placoderms and sea scorpions, and only a few hardy taxa survived. Thankfully, an upside of the rapid boom of nutrients released by the comparatively rapid establishment of terrestrial life meant that it was also able to take over and recover fairly quickly. Decomposers in the ocean helped clean the sludge, and the pace of nutrients washed downstream eased. By the early Carboniferous, harvests replenished the seas, and since the land was still thriving and giving more nutrients than the portal could ever aspire to require, the Eldritch God took its rest and slumbered for almost a hundred million years. The climate during this era was warm and wet. Sea levels were at an all-time high. Continents were fragmented so the humidity could easily and reliably be spread throughout, and rainforests and swamps made up a staggering majority of terrestrial ecosystems. It was in this lush Eden that an evolutionary arms race began. This was the first dynasty. While the first amphibians, reptiles, and stem mammals evolved on Earth, completely independent clades were evolving on Chimir. These groups have been diagnosed at the class level by assembly paleontologists. While this distinction can be useful for explaining relationships, it can also be quite misleading. A pigeon, for example, technically belongs to class Aves Reptilia and Sarco Terigii. You and I are in the same family as apes, but according to current consensus, we are ancestrally in Proconsulidae, our Eocene ancestors would be in the family Eosimiidae, and our early Cretaceous ancestors would be in the family Genghiotheriidae, and, and so on. You can never leave your ancestral clade. While there are as many as six classes of animal that evolved during the first dynasty, it is important to remember that while this distinction helps articulate the independence of life that evolved during this time, clade levels aren't real in the strictest sense. They are not definable. It's helpful to understand modern relationships, but they quickly become more confusing than clarifying in the context of the fossil record. For this reason, in my episodes, I generally refer to them as clade, rather than giving them Linnaean taxonomic rankings like family or order. Chimera and Megaraptorans, for example, are in the family Megaraptoridae, but also in two modern families, either Staraconicidae or Epirovenatoridae. The assembly uses Linnaean taxonomy as it was the convention in the 18th and 19th centuries when they were classifying Chimeran flora and fauna, and while it has fallen out of favor for the reasons I mentioned above, old habits die hard, and it is still the standard use for the organization. Also worth noting that their modern or recently extinct descendants may be distinct enough to warrant such a designation, yet their first dynasty representatives were obviously a lot closer in relationship with common ancestors as recent as the first harvest itself, so they may not seem to deserve this class level distinction for the first dynasty, and that's, again, part of the problem with Linnaean tiers in paleontology. The assembly refers to the six major clays that evolved during the first dynasty as classes, so that's what I'll be defaulting to despite my reservations for such rankings. Though there was a great deal of more familiar fauna and flora during the dynasty, for the sake of showing more new, 
I will be focusing for the remainder of this episode on the six endemic classes. The first we will be discussing are the Dynathii. This clade is presumed to be descendants of stegocephalians like Colosteids. They are diagnosed by a detachable pharyngeal jaw. Though some predatory lineages exist, and indeed that was the ancestral condition of the clade, their most famous members were Chimera's first mega herbivores. The primary jaws were robust and used for manipulating and breaking apart giant fungal obelisks, trees or club moss and seed fern, and ancient relatives of conifers. The secondary jaws are what actually tore off and swallowed pieces of food. This system has no analog on Earth, but it was extremely successful in this group of the first large herbivores of Chimere. Though the fossil record this far back in Chimere's prehistory is especially fragmentary, there have been enough fossils to suggest large Dinathians may have reached 5 to 6 tons. Chimere has many giants today, but this first era seems to be one of the few species of population abundance, not overall size, so these giant Dinathians definitely stood apart from the crowd. Another class that included large herbivores at this time was Ambuloichthia. Though Ambuloichthys itself included several multi-ton species, most were a lot smaller, ranging from a few centimeters to a meter in length. As the name suggests, these lobe-fin fish were proficient on land, though they were still tied to water for reproduction and the gills that supplemented their lungs requiring water. The air at the time was so humid that smaller species may have been fully terrestrial aside from needing to visit the water for spawning. One highly diverse lineage lost their gills entirely. It is assumed that the largest species of Amblio ichthys spent most of its time grazing in the shallows, though their clawed forelimbs enabled them to walk respectable distances on land, as suggested by a trackway found in the Southern Crescent. The third class to develop herbivores during this era was the Taurosteons. The hollow bones diagnostic of Taurosteons made them light yet durable frame from which they could grow large. This also helped them take to the trees and become highly proficient gliders, and eventually a lineage developed powered flight. Much like birds, they appear to have been filled with air sacs, something expanding from their lungs to enhance respiration while others were not adaptive and simply invaded various cavities, making them look quite outsized compared to their actual mass. Some of the largest animals of this time were orbivorous taurosteons, though the biggest dinathii were heavier. Their hollow nature appears to have been made them vulnerable to even the slightest dip in temperature, leading to sinus infection throughout the body, so while other clades could populate the polar regions, Taurosteons appear to have been restricted to the tropics of this already extreme hot-out climate. In this context, they were in the most diverse and prolific clade. Fabodonts were first described by their bean-shaped teeth, which are among the most common fossils to be found during this era of Chimera's history. However, seeing living Fabodonts and many of their ancestors, especially later in the First Dynasty, it can seem ridiculous that teeth are their diagnostic feature. Very quickly, this lineage evolved a highly specialized cranium, with a cornified beak and formidable collection of teeth that filled several batteries of each jaw along the palate, with corresponding rough tongues to help rapidly process the toughest of vegetation. Their eyes grew high on the head, and perhaps the strangest of all, their parietal eye increased in sophistication to a degree that it was a fully functional eye early in the First Dynasty. It is assumed that, like modern Fabodonts, the parietal eye had highly sophisticated color vision and less motion sensitivity, whereas the stalked eyes were more sensitive to movement and had fewer color receptors. Although the body adapted in many ways and morphotypes over time, the head of Fabodonts remained largely unchanged to what it looked like around 300 million years ago to today. A similar phenomenon is observed in the Decinodonts of the Permian continent today. It's important to remember that simple and basal features have a massive range of adaptive options, whereas derived and specialized traits are much harder to adapt. Mammals had extremely basal cynodont anatomy for most of their evolution, which was a prime template from which they could 
undergo an adaptive radiation that took us to modern mammal diversity today. If we had already lost teeth and grew a beak like dicynodonts, we almost certainly would not have seen mammals diversify to modern degrees. Such was the case for phabodonts, which later in the dynasty evolved arboreal, legless, aquatic, bipedal, and even flying clades, yet the head remained fairly locked in morphology. The large and abundant herbivore caste naturally supported a wide range of predators. Taurosteans, Ambuloetheans, and Dinatheans each produced large predators, but the top predators throughout most swamps were the semi-aquatic Carbosuchians, so named for being discovered in coal deposits. These predators looked very much like lizards or crocodiles with fluked tails. Basal Carbosuchians had wide heads, yet their more derived members sported long snouts packed with gripping teeth. A low-demand ambush hunting strategy worked very well for them in a world of swamps. Some smaller taxa were arboreal, being a bit more active in chasing down prey in the trees, and these took over the tropics. Yet another predator dominated this realm to the south. The heterotherms trace their ancestry to the first dynasty. Though their more famous descendants, the Morkutlat, are blind and hunt by sound, these early representatives were visual hunters. Their metabolism enabling them to rapidly switch between an efficient stasis and rapid endothermy was especially successful in the cooler regions of the southern hemisphere, but the warmth of the tropics, it was a negligible benefit. It did help them become volant, flying after insects and gliding and eventually flying terostions, and was excellent at night or in open territory, where they really came into their own. Hunting by echolocation and sound with vision as a supplement guided the evolution of the arboreal clade and eventually set the stage for their Morkutlat descendants. The non-Newtonian slime that was the primary defense was easy to maintain in this humid and nutrient-rich world. As time went on, many of these clades adapted. Continents moving together not only enabled interchange, and the swamps truly came into their own, and these six clades were thrown together to make an extremely competitive global ecosystem. There were still high sea levels and enough gaps in the continents to enable extreme humidity. There were extinctions due to increased competition, but it drove body plan and niche complexity to a degree we did not see in Earth's Carboniferous. In this more competitive world, the lightweight Taurosteons came out on top with the most abundant herbivores. They could grow larger on less food, and their volant members were extremely widespread. Their many-chambered lungs were extremely efficient, and packed with openings throughout the sides and throughout feigned skin, kept damp by the humid air, enabled a very fast metabolism with shockingly low demands. Dinatheans were in second place, with a lineage of giants being the most common. The enormous Ambuloichthians were restricted to a few pockets. The Ambuloichthians that abandoned gills and took to the trees, and these had many limbs that evolved from all six fins, proved quite successful over the more basal body plan now restricted to the swamps and waterways. Fabadons were still small, yet underwent perhaps the most extreme body plan diversity at this time as mentioned earlier. Their aquatic lineages were extremely successful, spreading throughout the world and becoming proficient filter feeders and fish specialists. A clade of predators that specialized in terostions and exploiting the weakness of thin skin, especially on the sides connecting to their secondary lungs, were from their same lineage. These terostions were Chimera's first dragons. With short, broad wings necessary for life in dense forests and swamps, they've developed a robust venom glands that would project onto their herbivorous cousins. This venom easily seeped into the thin skin of their prey, which is especially effective on the pucked sides and secondary lungs. In response, a few developed various resistances, either by sticking near water or evolving plates to seal the openings when under stress. A very weird skull of a Taurostion dragon, Dracocetus, was recently offered up for study by the Great Library. 
Though long vaulted as a filter feeding aquatic dragon, comparison to a partial skull excavated by assembly researchers in northern Nikar has led to the conclusion that they were actually volant. In the era of Chimer today, up in the higher troposphere and lower stratosphere, aeroplankton of indigenous Chimerian magic has made an ecosystem unlike any we have on Earth today. A similar collection of floating magic is also found in Kaishel's forest and several cave ecosystems. It has long been theorized that this ecosystem is more robust in Chimere's history, perhaps throughout the era of most terrestrial habitats, and insect and tetrapod overhunting may have led to their demise. A flying filter feeder, weighing upwards of a few hundred pounds, certainly supports the idea that back during the First Dynasty these aerial ecosystems were much more abundant and widespread, perhaps aided by humidity in the air, though overhunting by insects and testropods, like the whale dragon Dracocetus, may well have been their undoing. Unfortunately, the shifting continents that built up this ecological golden age would contribute to its undoing. Around 265 million years ago, the rotation of the continents and moving closer together gradually cut off various wind and water currents, making for a generally isolated interior. As things became increasingly arid, the once dominant Taurostions, which relied heavily on humid, warm air found throughout the once endless swamped homes, found themselves increasingly restricted. Despite their success, they were among the first to experience major extinctions. While it was still considered the first dynasty, it seems the portal's territory was within one of the more arid ranges and initiated a harvest which brought new fauna from Earth at a time which was a very arid Permian. The new therapsids and reptiles were unable to make a dent in the fiercely competitive jungles and swamps, yet found little competition in the open and dry habitats, at least near the portal. Fabadons, heterotherms, and dinatheans each had dry terrain representatives evolving at the same time, so Permian fauna did encounter competition as they spread. This process only worsened for native fauna as time went on, with a combination of climate change reducing habitat and now plenty of derived and formidable new fauna in open territory. Giant Ambulo-Ichthians went endangered and possibly extinct, as did most Taurostrions, including the many large herbivores and dragons, and with their demise, the Carbosuchians also disappeared. Fabadons, Heterotherms, and Dinatheans actually did quite well in these arid years, especially thriving in the supercontinent that now includes Kaishel, Picardia, and Arvel, thanks to being terrestrial isolated by the time of the Permian fauna spread, and subsequent competition. Dinatheans and heterotherms both followed Fabadons into the water, exploring piscivore, herbivore, and even macro-predatory niches. Just when it seemed like things might be coming to an ecological understanding, that a new cast of Permian and indigenous fauna might find some stability, calamity came in the form of an extraterrestrial threat. An asteroid. Though not as large as the asteroid which ended the Mesozoic, and Chimera being a larger planet further reduced the impact, it came at a terrible time for native fauna, especially since it struck the tropics on the west coast of the Nikari Karulan supercontinent. Being kicked while they were down proved a disaster, and ended the first dynasty. Though all had survived, and indeed the heterotherms and Fabadons thrived in the south, the supercontinent of Nikar, Kairul, the Permian continent, and islands were quite devastated and became flooded with fauna from new harvests from Earth's late Permian. The Permian dynasty of Chimere began just as the era ended on Earth, with the Siberian traps, and for the next 60 million years, there would be no harvest, and therapsids would go on to establish themselves as the dominant megafauna of Chimere's tropical continents. While their era came to an end 260 million years ago, there are still relics of all six lineages found in Chimere today. 
The heterotherms and phabodonts have the most known descendants of the known world, and the dynastic extinction leveled much of the known world's habitat, spelling doom for the other relics. Yet a region of southeastern Kyrule is a primordial jungle and wetland, which has been documented with abundance of little relics. Bipedal and hopping phabodonts are a common sight in the brush, volant terostrians, legless dinathians, and even a species of fairly large ambioichthian, along with several arboreal cousins. There is even a very small lineage of Carbosuchians. Though they no longer claim dominion over the planet, the relics of the first dynasty in these swamps, holding on amidst competition from very derived dinosaurs and mammals from later harvests, prove their ecological merit and the fact that evolution doesn't stall just because a lineage branches off from those which dominate on Earth today. Thank you so much to David for sponsoring this episode. Especially after the monumental undertaking that was the Ballad of Kahai last week, this was difficult to assemble, but I'm very thankful for the opportunity, and it has helped me set the stage for Clay's an episode planned for Down the Road. Having the overview of First Dynasty Clades be my first episode of the new year just felt right, and I'm very thankful for David for the opportunity. Thank you so much to my new Patreon patrons. Your support is an important part of how I'm able to make these episodes every week. Also, thank you for watching. YouTube apparently doesn't like it when I talk about why watching helps, but my videos have been flagged for in the past, but just, just know that it helps. Thanks again to everyone who made it possible for me to make Chimere a full-time gig this year, and I'll see you all next week for the Renjuyu, a semi-aquatic hyenodont and one of the top predators of the Soritic wetlands. That's all for now. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Cheers, folks!